and iPlayer. The BBC News at 10 o'clock with Hugh Edwards. Tonight at 10, the Prime Minister is dealt another blow as his ethics adviser suddenly resigns. Lord Guiter said it's reasonable to suggest that Mr Johnson may have broken the ministerial code in relation to lockdown parties in Downing Street. After facing MPs yesterday, Lord Guide apparently concluded that his position, advising Boris Johnson on standards of ministerial behaviour, was no longer tenable. Resignation is, is one of the rather blunt but uh, few tools available to uh, an independent uh, adviser. We'll have the latest on the resignation and how damaging it could be for the Prime Minister. Next week, we'll see the biggest strike on the railways in living memory, affecting millions of journeys across Britain. It's going to be a real inconvenience for our pupils, um, especially at a time where we've got public examinations going on. More than 100 migrants crossed the English Channel today after more than 400 yesterday. So the government says the deportation to Rwanda is still on the cards. And the England and Wales Cricket Board brings charges against the Yorkshire Club and several individuals over allegations of racism. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, there's no room in the squad for former England captain Steph Horton at the Women's Euros next month. Welcome to BBC News at 10. In the latest blow to the Prime Minister's authority, his ethics adviser, Lord Geit, announced his resignation this evening. He's the second ethics adviser that Boris Johnson has lost in under two years. Lord Geit had faced tough questioning from a parliamentary committee yesterday, during which he said it was reasonable to suggest that Mr Johnson may have broken the ministerial code in relation to the scandal over lockdown parties in Downing Street. Lord Guite, who used to work for Her Majesty the Queen and who took up this role in April last year, has spoken of his frustrations with the Prime Minister's actions. Our political editor, Chris Mason, has the latest. I do try, um, you know, to make things work as, as, uh, as, well, as, I, as well as I can. And, you can hear the uh, exasperation in Lord Guite's um, voice. This was him in front of a committee of MPs yesterday. And tonight, this statement of few words and even less detail. With regret, I feel that it's right that I'm resigning from my post as independent advisor on ministers' interests. Lord Guy used to be the Queen's most senior advisor before taking on the job he's just left. His task as independent advisor, overseeing and investigating ethics and behaviour in government at a time dominated by rows about the Prime Minister's own conduct. The ministerial code is very clear uh, in that the sole jurisdiction over it is uh, commanded by the Prime Minister. Uh, himself, and that's why uh, that's how we ensure there's good administration, good governance, uh, and of course we uh, are always going to be guided by the rules and the principles in that code, and that's what we always bear in mind as ministers. This very arrangement was clearly awkward for Lord Guy. Just last month, he said it was a legitimate question to ask if Boris Johnson had breached the ministerial code by breaking COVID laws, but the code's author and guardian, as he put it, were. Mr Johnson. The Prime Minister denied such a breach. Given that, he was asked yesterday whether you contemplated resignation. There are a few instruments available to an independent advisor and um... I'm going to take that answer as at least it was on the agenda. Uh, we've mentioned before in evidence that it's always on the agenda um, as an available um, uh, remedy to a particular problem and one that my predecessor indeed exercised. That was a reference to the resignation of this man, Sir Alex Allen, who gave up the same job in November 2020 after finding the Home Secretary Priti Patel had broken the ministerial code, but Boris Johnson wouldn't sack her. Tonight, a government spokesman said, We are surprised by this decision, given Lord Guite's commitment to the role. Whilst we are disappointed, 
We thank Lord Gates for his public service. The person who should have left Downing Street tonight is the Prime Minister himself. And the whole country will be wondering just how long do they have to wait for those Tory MPs to do the right thing. Thank you very much. It's this long-standing public servant who's walked, leaving plenty of questions behind him. It would appear that Lord Guy had concluded that enough was enough, that his position was untenable. It would also appear, Hugh, that there are further details yet to emerge that may also have contributed to his decision. Now, this matters because the Prime Minister had just this week managed to shift attention away from questions about his conduct and onto policy. And now this, the swirl of headlines coming back. One final thought, he is without an ethics adviser yet again. I walked down Whitehall a little earlier on and I couldn't see a queue of people who want the job. Chris, many thanks again. Chris Mason with the latest there at Westminster. Let's uh, move on then to the day's other main news. It's already being billed as the biggest rail strike of modern times, involving tens of thousands of workers from Network Rail as well as from 13 individual train companies. As things stand, not enough progress has been made in negotiations between employers and the unions to stop the walkouts from going ahead next week. Now, we're talking about 40,000 staff due to go on strike on June the 21st and the 23rd and the 25th in a long-running dispute about pay levels and job losses and indeed pensions. Now, Network Rail has produced this map. It shows basically where services will run and maybe crucially where they won't be running. And the main urban centres are going to be prioritised. That leaves extensive areas of Scotland, as we can see there, without any train services. Similarly, areas west of Birmingham, much of Wales and many coastal areas will not be reachable by train. Our transport correspondent, Katie Austin, reports now on what's shaping up to be a week of major travel chaos for millions of people. The clock is ticking down to the biggest rail strike in decades. Among those affected will be 300 children who take the train to this school in Bradford. Some have GCSE and A-level exams next week. Well, to be honest, I'm not even sure how I'll get to school. Like, for the past four years, I've got the train every single day and I'm not sure my parents can give me less school. If my mum has to pick me up, it'll be much later, so I have less time to do stuff. In the mornings, I'd probably have to set off earlier, which means like being more punctual, getting up earlier, which just adds on to everything else. On the three walkout days, a fraction of normal services will operate on main routes, and some areas will get no trains at all, including Dundee, where there was frustration today, but also sympathy for striking workers. Yeah, it's like inconvenient, but I guess it's, um, it's understandable. I'm sure it's frustrating, but I think people do deserve to be paid more. Network rail signalers are involved in this strike, and those replacing them will only be able to cover part of the day. That means where services do run, they'll start later and finish earlier than normal, running between about half seven in the morning and 6.30 in the evening. For example, that means the last train going from Newcastle to London will depart just before three o'clock in the afternoon, and the last train going from here in London to Southampton will leave about five. And the knock-on impact of strike days means disruption for the whole week. The RMT union says the dispute is over proposed job cuts and the need for a pay rise reflecting the cost of living. The rail industry is under pressure to save money following the pandemic and rail bosses insist modernisation is needed. Negotiations so far have failed to reach a settlement. I'm determined to try and find a way forward, but I can't negotiate on, on my own. Uh, so, yeah, we think we've, been, we've done everything we can and I, I can see a path through that would achieve a deal, but, but again, it does require movement on both sides. The RMT has claimed the government is standing in the way of a resolution. We're working very hard to get a settlement, but we think this is unlikely at the moment. And the reason we think it's unlikely is, call us cynical, but we think the government, uh, the Department for Transport, they're in the background holding the pen. It seems that they don't want a settlement. Today, the RMT called for an urgent meeting with the Transport Secretary and Chancellor, but the government dismissed the idea, saying unions must negotiate with the employers. While thousands of passengers rethink their plans, work is ongoing to figure out how much freight can be kept moving on the railways, for example, construction materials, fuel, food and drink. This firm says business customers have tried to stockpile, but even with contingency plans, the strikes will be disruptive.
Of the three days, I, I think that's manageable. We can catch up either before or after the dispute. If it becomes a lengthy dispute, that's when you start to get into worries about whether commodities or, or stuff that goes on the shelf is likely to start being affected. The chances of next week's strikes being called off seem slim. The question then is whether more follow. Katie Austin, BBC News. And for full details on how the strike will affect services in your area, there are updates. Uh, there's plenty of news and analysis on BBC News Online. That's bbc.co.uk forward slash news. And of course, you can use the BBC News app for all the latest information. Now, it's been confirmed that 444 migrants tried to cross the English Channel in small boats yesterday. That's the highest daily number for two months. And today, around 150 people were brought ashore near Dover. Uh, the UK government says it remains committed to its highly controversial plan of taking some migrants to Rwanda to claim asylum there instead. The first plane was, in effect, grounded last night, just before takeoff, when the European Court of Human Rights intervened. And the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has rejected Labour's claim that the scheme is just a political gimmick. Our Deputy Political Editor, Vicky Young, reports. Rescue missions in the Channel. Calm weather means more boats arriving. Eleven came yesterday carrying more than 440 people, the highest number for two months. The government wants to discourage those taking this dangerous journey, but its policy to send them to Rwanda to claim asylum there is being buffeted from all sides. Statement Home Secretary Priti Patel. Today the Home Secretary said the UK had the right to control its borders. We will not be put off by the inevitable legal last-minute challenges, nor we will allow mobs, Madam Deputy Speaker, to block removals. We will not stand idly by and let organised crime gangs, who are despicable in their nature and their conduct, evil people, treat human beings as cargo. But Labour say the plans make Britain look shameful around the world. Chasing this headlines. isn't a long-term plan, headlines. it is a short-term stunt. About. Everyone can see it. It's, it's not about. serious policy, it's shameless posturing and she knows it. It's not building consensus, it's just pursuing division. It is government by gimmick. After days of legal action in the British courts, there were just four passengers due to leave on the first flight to Rwanda last night. After a last-minute intervention by a judge from the European Court of Human Rights, the plane stayed on the tarmac. Many Conservatives are now questioning the powers of that court in Strasbourg. This is what the British people want us to do. Control immigration, come across in those boats. So how is it right that this court is overruled, all of our courts yep. and this parliament? Yeah. Yeah. Politically, the Home Secretary might not be too bothered about a fight with lawyers here and a court in Strasbourg. But ultimately, she does need to come up with a workable policy. Ploughing ahead with plans for another flight to Rwanda leaves ministers open to the accusation they could be wasting hundreds of thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money. But until a flight does take off, it's hard to gauge what impact it will have on those trying to come here. At this unofficial camp in Dunkirk, many are thinking about their next move. Aram says he will still try to cross to England. We are going to cross the English Channel, and God willing, this deportation to Rwanda doesn't include us. And if the UK send thousands of refugees to Rwanda, let's send us too. I think Rwanda is far better than Iraqi Kurdistan. Mustafa has come from Afghanistan and will also attempt the crossing. People go because they're helpless. No one does it for fun. They do it because there's no choice. They do understand you can die by getting inside these boats, but people are helpless. Off camera, some told the BBC the plans could make them think again. An uncertain journey lies ahead for these men and a key government policy. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. Well, last night's judgment from the European Court of Human Rights, which came less than an hour before the planned takeoff of that deportation flight to Rwanda, has raised questions about the legal procedure surrounding cases like these that our home editor Mark Easton has been investigating. It was the intervention of the European Court of Human Rights late last night that turned a flight to Rwanda 
into a flight to nowhere. But how come a judge in Strasbourg could effectively stop the policy of the UK government in its tracks? Well, Britain has left the EU, of course, but we are still in the Council of Europe, and that's entirely separate from the EU, set up after World War II to oversee a European Convention on Human Rights with a court to make sure that signatories like Britain abide by their obligations. So how come the UK court said one thing and the European court said another? The answer is they were looking at slightly different things. The UK judges had to balance the right of a sovereign government to implement its policies against the potential harm to those due to be on last night's flight. They ruled the welfare concerns did not outweigh the right to govern, if you like, and that the plane could take off. But the judge in Strasbourg noted that the UK courts have agreed to adjudicate next month on whether the whole Rwanda policy is lawful or not. And that judicial review is expected by the end of July. The Prime Minister said he still wants to send asylum seekers to Rwanda before the lawfulness of the policy has been tested in court. Last night, the European Court stopped the flight. The judge was worried that if the policy was found to be unlawful, those people sent to East Africa might be unable to come back to the UK. And that potentially breach their rights under the European Convention. So should, could asylum seekers be sent to Rwanda in the six weeks before the lawfulness of the whole scheme's been decided? The Home Office says it's already preparing for the next removal plane, and while it could attempt to argue its case at the European Court, it must be in doubt that any asylum seeker will be sent to Rwanda before August, or at all. That was our Home Editor, Mark Easton, with that analysis. Now, the UK government says it's disappointed that the EU is launching legal action in response to Boris Johnson's plans to change the Brexit deal relating to trade between Britain and Northern Ireland. On Monday, ministers at Westminster outlined a bill which could scrap some arrangements on trade, tax and governance. The EU says that such changes would be illegal. Our Europe editor, Katja Adler, is with me here in the studio to explain a little more. Katja? Well, Hugh, the EU is furious. It says the UK changing the Brexit agreement on Northern Ireland unilaterally is unacceptable. Why? Well, it says the text known as the protocol is the result of years of negotiations between the EU and the UK. A compromise solution, it says, enshrined in law intended to protect the peace process in Northern Ireland, UK internal trade and also the EU single market after Brexit. As a warning today, the EU announced it's launching legal proceedings against the government for already not respecting parts of the protocol, it said. If successful, this could result in a fine for the UK. The EU has also threatened possible future tariffs on UK goods or even suspending the Brexit trade deal altogether. But with the cost of living crisis and the war in Ukraine, there's little appetite for a trade war in Brussels. Still, this was the EU's chief negotiator today. Let there be no doubt, there is no legal nor political justification whatsoever for unilaterally changing an international agreement. So let's call it a spade a spade. This is illegal. Illegal? Absolutely not, says the government. It says it's been forced to act. The current protocol, it insists, is upsetting the delicate social and political balance in Northern Ireland, threatening the peace process. Today, a government spokesperson said the EU continued to insist it's unwilling to change the protocol, forcing the government, they said, to change parts of the text that are causing the problems. The EU and the UK both say they would prefer to come up with solutions together, and they are cooperating closely when it comes to Ukraine. But... On Northern Ireland, Hugh, they are at loggerheads again. Katja, many thanks once again. Katja Adler, they're our Europe editor. Now, Yorkshire Cricket Club and a number of individuals have been charged by the England and Wales Cricket Board with breaches of its code of conduct following an investigation into racism at the club. The charges relate to bringing the game into disrepute and breaking the anti-discrimination code, and they were brought after claims were made last year by the former player Azim Rafiq. He has welcomed the charges and said the process had been gruelling for him, but necessary. Hearings are expected to start in the autumn, as our sports editor Dan Rowan reports. English cricket was on a high. Yesterday's stunning victory over New Zealand in the second test, one of the greatest wins in the team's history. 
But just 24 hours later came the latest development in the saga that's cast a shadow over the sport. Yorkshire and a number of unnamed individuals charged by the ECB over allegations of racism at the county following a six-month investigation into its handling of claims made by former player Azim Rafiq. In a statement, the governing body said the charges arise from alleged breaches of conduct which is improper or which may be prejudicial to the interests of cricket or which may bring the ECB, the game of cricket or any cricketer into disrepute and its anti-discrimination code. Last year, Rafiq gave harrowing testimony to MPs about the racist abuse he said he'd suffered by some of his former colleagues at Yorkshire. There just seems to be an acceptance in the institution um, from the leaders and no one, no one ever stamped it out. The whistleblower claimed former teammate Gary Balance was among those to have used racist language towards him. Balance said he deeply regretted doing so. Former Yorkshire and England captain Michael Vaughan revealed he'd been accused of making racist comments to Rafiq and other players, but has repeatedly denied the claims. Today in a statement, Rafiq said he welcomed the charges, but that this has been another gruelling but unfortunately necessary process. But I hope this all means that no young player ever goes through such pain and alienation again. Last year, Yorkshire, who today lost in the county championship, sparked outrage by not disciplining anyone despite Rafiq being found to have suffered racial harassment. A damning parliamentary report then concluded discrimination was endemic in the sport. The absolute key thing is what actually happens to the game more generally. Can we be certain there aren't other Yorkshires out there? And we need to be sure that the ECB uh, has a game under its control which is inclusive, which means that everyone from every background can feel safe and can feel welcomed in it. Having regained the lucrative international hosting rights that it lost in the wake of the scandal after governance reforms and an overhaul in leadership, Yorkshire are now preparing to host a buoyant England next week here in the third test. But for both this county and the game at large, moving on from this crisis is proving no easy task. Dan Rowan, BBC News, Headingley. In Afghanistan, more than a million children are facing severe levels of malnutrition as the country struggles with a worsening economic crisis. Humanitarian aid is being delivered, but wider development funding is not, and there are warnings that much more help is now needed. Many families have resorted to desperate measures, including changes to what they eat, as our Afghan correspondent Sukunda Kamani reports. <laughs> We're in one of Afghanistan's busiest markets. There's plenty for sale, but for most families, money is tighter than ever. This stall tells you how much some are struggling. These sacks are full of stale, leftover bread, normally fed to cattle. Now, more people than ever are eating it themselves. The better quality bread is on the top of the bag. When poor people come to buy, they pick these better ones. Look, this one cannot be eaten. Before, five people used to buy this bread in a day. Now it's more than 20 people. What does it feel like doing this job and seeing so many people having to buy this bread? I pray to God to get rid of this misery and poverty from my country. The life of Afghan people right now is like a bird which has been locked in a cage with no food or water. Bread is the staple food here in Afghanistan. But there's a deep economic crisis. International development funding the country relied on has largely been cut off and central bank reserves frozen by the West over concerns about the Taliban's hardline treatment of women. But it's poor families like Hashmatullah's we're now struggling with rising food prices. Before, did you ever used to have to buy bread from here? In the past, I used to make five pounds per day. But now, I barely earn one pound. I've been working since this morning, and all I can afford to buy is this bread. Leftover bread is handed over by bakeries, restaurants and homes to scrap collectors like 14-year-old Mohammed. But with around half the country going hungry, there's less bread, less of everything. There's not enough work. And my job is very hard, Mohammed says. Hashmatullah is making his way home after another disappointing day at the market. He's doing his best 
to keep his three young sons in school rather than sending them out to work. But it means surviving mainly on stale bread, softened with tomatoes and onions. You work hard for your family. How does it feel just being able to bring this home for them? I feel ashamed in front of my family that I am so poor I cannot afford to provide them good food. There's nothing I can do. Even if I try and borrow money, no one will lend it to me. My sons are really thin because they are not eating well. I cannot afford meat even once a month. Outside Kabul's bakeries, women wait for loaves of fresh bread to be donated. Even when billions were pouring into this country, corruption, the war, meant that life here was a struggle. Now, the war might be over, but for many, the struggle is getting even harder. Sikandar Kamani, BBC News, Kabul. Now, a week tomorrow, on Thursday, June the 23rd, Boris Johnson's government will face not one, but two big electoral tests, with two parliamentary by-elections for Westminster, at Tiverton and Honiton, that's in Devon, and Wakefield, which is in West Yorkshire. Now, both of these seats present significant challenges, and the cathedral city of Wakefield, certainly a test, not just for Boris Johnson, but a test for Labour. Can Labour win back its former heartlands? Just a word about Wakefield, because it's going to teach us lots of lessons when that result comes in. Surrounded, of course, by former mining communities, kind of semi-urban areas as well. This was a Labour seat for decades, until 2019, when the Tories took the seat from Labour for the first time, with that rather modest majority, which Labour are eyeing, of 3,000 300 or so, and really, you need to just consider the context. From 1931 all the way to 2019, this was a Labour seat, 87 years. So you can get the sense of the contest. Will Boris Johnson hang on in what we call this Red Wall area in the Midlands and the North, where those old Labour seats went Conservative in 2019? Will Keir Starmer's Labour win them back? 15 candidates, as you can see, it's drawn in lots of candidates because they all want a bit of the limelight. Uh, the list is there for you, and the list is also on the BBC News website. So have a look at that if you want a, a look in closer detail. Alex Forsyth, my colleague, has been to Wakefield to look at the battle that will reveal the state of the parties in this very important battleground. Behind every door in Wakefield, there's a decision to be made a political choice in a by-election that's being closely watched. Robert, who's lived here for 50 years, has certainly noticed the attention. There's been plenty of paraphernalia coming through the door, like, you know. It's promises and promises. A few streets away, Mary and Billy have also had canvases knock at their door. Most people I've talked to are absolutely amazed that there's 15 candidates for one job. <laughs> It is a crowded field. Historically, this was a Labour stronghold, but support crumbled in 2019 when Boris Johnson swept through parts of the Midlands and North. Now the fight's on again. Labour is pushing hard while the Conservatives are trying to hold support. At a local heritage site, some are clear who's got theirs. I like Boris. I think on all the major issues, he has done absolutely brilliantly. I'm just thinking about voting Labour. With what the policies are, I just go with that. I think we need someone else instead of Boris Johnson. I just think he's a fool. In the city centre, there's talk of the need for investment, jobs, better public transport. Local issues matter in a contest with national significance. This by-election is being seen as something of a test for the party leaders. After recent political turmoil, can Boris Johnson still command support in places like this? For Sir Keir Starmer, can he rebuild Labour's backing where he really needs to? Tattoo artist Dave was a Labour voter all his life, but switched to the Tories in 2019 because of Brexit. Now, facing the struggle of rising bills, he's lost faith across the board. Let us down, really. Boris Johnson had delivered. I think they could have kept the vote here. I'd like to think I could have voted Labour, but no, not with Keir Starmer in. Nobody represents working people anymore. Not far away, Scott, whose specialist woodshop we first visited during the pandemic, shares a sense of disillusion. They just want that little notch on the belt of we've got Wakefield again. It should go to who's ever going to do best for Wakefield. It's not about it's red or blue, because as soon as this by-election is done, we'll be forgot about again. 
For now, though, the political focus is on Wakefield, where smaller parties and independents are among those vying for residents' votes in a contest that promises to measure the public mood and leave letterboxes full of leaflets. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, Wakefield. Time is uh, 29 minutes past 10. Let's have a sneak preview of the weather. And here's Thomas. I think you'll have to unbutton your collar, Hugh, in the next couple of days. It's going to get very hot. Uh, the temperatures really will be shooting up over the next few days. Today we got up to around 28 degrees in London. How hot is it going to get by Friday? 33 degrees. Certainly not unprecedented for this time of the year, but it's certainly on the hot side. Uh, look at that compared to the average of only around 20 or so in many parts of England and Wales. Worth noting the very high levels of pollen that we've been dealing with for the last few days and also tomorrow high levels of UV as well. So let's have a look at the picture first thing in the morning. England and Wales, lots of sunshine, around 12 to 15 degrees, more cloud here in the southwest, and that's really how it's going to stay through most of the afternoon tomorrow. Variable amounts of cloud for Northern Ireland and Scotland with occasional showers, but England and Wales will be hotting up. And the temperatures, 28 in London, there's a possibility of 30 somewhere in the southeast and East Anglia, but I think more typically we're talking about the low 20s across England and Wales, high teens further north. Now there is an Atlantic weather front that's heading our way. Here's the low pressure coming in pushing in that fresher air the hot air on Friday morning sweeping in from the south all the way from France so this is going to be the peak of the heat on Friday and the thinking is temperatures getting up to around about 33 to 34 degrees Celsius but already at this stage that cooler air invading the northwest of the UK and it's that boundary between the hot in the south and the much cooler in the north that will be slipping across the country during the course of the weekend and then it's all going to go bang. And once again, I want to emphasize those UV levels, that really strong sunshine, Friday night into Saturday. I'm sure a lot of us will be enjoying ourselves before that weather turns thundery. And I think the biggest storms probably across parts of England and Wales. So a brief heat wave in the south, and then it's all gonna go bang. 33, Thomas, no thanks. Okay, it's far <laughs> too hot. Thank you very much. Thomas there with the weather. That is BBC News at 10 on uh, June the 15th. Uh, there's more analysis, of course, of the day's main stories, and that's on Newsnight, which is starting uh, in a neighbouring studio with my colleague Faisal in just a few moments' time. And, of course, here on BBC One, the news continues. All of our colleagues in the nations and regions of the UK standing by with the news where you are. But from all of us on the 10 team, thanks for watching. Good night. <laughs>